Welcome to Bethel Bible Fellowship. Glad you could be here with us this morning. Our passage this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, going on with our study of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 11. Now, if you, if you um, don't have your Bible, or if you want to follow along with the English Standard Version, which is what I often use up here, um, we've printed out an insert that contains that passage in your bulletin, <clears throat> and we'll be looking at that later on. So we're reading 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. Paul writing to the church at Corinth. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. <clears throat> All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Father, we come to you and we trust that your word is true. If these things are true, then, Lord, somehow this message and this passage fits into the life of this body. <clears throat> and yet, as we just read, if you don't empower it by your Spirit, it does us no good. So we ask you to do that. By the power of the Spirit that you've made to dwell within us, both us as individuals and us as a body, we ask you to take that word and make it alive and speak it to our hearts where we are for what we need. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard the story this week about a woman who's... Um, car stalled on the road near Magnum, Oklahoma. <clears throat> she was frightened, so she called roadside assistance and asked them to send out a mechanic, which they did. When the mechanic got there and he checked out her car and he looked around, he found out that she just ran out of gas. So he informed her, your car's out of gas. And her very first question was, well, will it be bad for my car if I drive it with an empty gas tank? <laughs> Now, we laugh at that because it's obvious she has no idea how a car is powered. And it struck me when I heard that story that unfortunately the same thing can be said about a lot of Christians when it comes to the question of how our lives and how the church is powered. Can there be any question that the Holy Spirit is the source of power for our lives and for the church? And yet, oddly, it seems as though the Holy Spirit is the one person of the Trinity who is most often overlooked, the least understood, and unfortunately, often the most misunderstood. There are those who overemphasize the Holy Spirit and his ministry. There are those who underemphasize the, the Spirit and his ministry, and there are those who completely ignore the Holy Spirit and his ministry. Some people, they get so fixated on the gift of the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the church in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost that that is all they think of when they think about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 and the, and the sign gifts that were given to the church at that point. Now obviously, a much broader look than that is required for us if we're going to understand the Holy Spirit. And as I said last week, that's exactly what we're going to be doing over the next several weeks even months, as we look at chapters 12, 13, and 14 in 1 Corinthians, this is a study of the Holy Spirit. Now, before we actually get into our passage this morning, <clears throat> since the Spirit is so misunderstood, I thought we'd take a quick overview of the Spirit's ministry to the church. Um, we've already mentioned the outpouring of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2, which seems to be the centerpiece for a whole lot of people. But even before Pentecost, John the Baptist said, 
in Matthew chapter 3. As for me, he told the people he was baptizing, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I'm not even fit to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And as we saw last week, that is the baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that saves us. Jesus, when he was preparing his disciples for the future, he said to them in John 16, I'm leaving, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you, he will guide you into all truth. That's a promise for us. On another occasion when Jesus was training his disciples to be kingdom ambassadors, he assured them in Luke chapter 12, not to worry, he said, when you're brought before synagogues and rulers and authorities, don't worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you what you should say at that time. And that promise holds true for us today. I've experienced it in my own life. In Romans chapter 8, there's the promise <clears throat> that when we're weak and we, we are so weak and so loaded down with the sin and the cares of this world that we don't know how to pray, we're told the Holy Spirit will intercede for us on our behalf before the Father with groans that are deeper than words can even express. If you remember back in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul stated that he spoke when he spoke to the Corinthians when he was there in his ministry, when he spoke as a teacher or a preacher or maybe even in one-on-one -on -one discipleship, that he spoke, quote, not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. What a promise. I, human wisdom is so lacking and worldly wis wisdom is completely wrong as we saw in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. God promises us his wisdom that comes down from above as we see in James chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, Peter said, but first of all know this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. What a great assurance that we have that this, this right here, is the inspired, infallible, eternal Word of God. Whatever other kind of guidance that you have in your life, this is the only guidance that you can find that will actually be rock-solid and without mistake, the eternal word of God. It truly is an expression of God's love for us, that he would reveal himself to us and not leave us in the dark. <clears throat> and of course, as we saw in the message last week, no one comes to Christ except that the Spirit convicts us and breaks us and draws us and then opens our eyes so that we can come to the point of conversion. And then he's the one who washes over us and regenerates us and renews us in that instance, instant of salvation. And then that same spirit comes and he makes residence in our body. And he indwells us bodily. And Jesus promises that that same spirit will flow from our lives like rivers of living water. We have the promise that the Holy Spirit will flow through us to the people that we minister to that the ministry that we give is a life-giving ministry. And that's not all. Well, I'm not even scratching the surface here, and I'm certainly not trying to be exhaustive on this, but on top of all that I've just mentioned, in the midst of all these promises, the Holy Spirit then makes himself the glue that holds us together as a body. God commanded us to be one. He commanded us to be unified. And then he comes to us as the Holy Spirit, and he empowers us. He gives us the power to do just that. And one of the things that he does to make us one is he gives us gifts, spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts that we can employ to nurture one another and to serve one another, and that nurturing and that serving each other in our needs knits us together as a body. In the same way that you were knit together in your mother's womb, as we're told in Psalm 139, so we as a church, as a body, are being knit together because we have needs, and then God equips us to meet each other's needs, and we become a body. Now, unfortunately, unity was in short supply in the church in Corinth. 
as we saw last week, the, the believers in Corinth, they were using their spiritual gifts to measure each other and to compare each other with, them, with each other um, to see who was the most spiritual, and it was causing disunity and division in the church. And so that's why Paul writes 1 Corinthians 12. That is the reason he writes 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14. In other words, the emphasis of Paul's teaching here is not on the gifts of the Spirit, but on the Spirit. The burden on Paul's heart here in these passages was the lack of unity in the church. So on that insert in your bulletin, I borrowed an idea from a commentator by the name of Gordon Fee to try to show the emphasis and the flow of Paul's argument in our passage this morning. Now this, when I read this morning from this passage, I read from this sheet, so you can actually read from left to right all the way down the page. This is the entire passage, nothing added except emphasis and nothing subtracted. All I did was try to separate it out so that you can see that diversity, variety, is over here on the left side of the page, and unity in the spirit is over here on the right side of the page. And that Paul really does lay this out in that kind of an outline. And what it does for us is it shows us that clearly variety or diversity is part of God's plan for us as Christians and as a church. God never intended for all of us to be exactly alike. He didn't. Let's just look at the first paragraph on that insert, verses 4 through 6. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So, there are varieties of, of gifts and ministries and activities or workings, but it's the same God. And if you look really closely at the, the nouns used to identify God, you see that very clearly there is a revelation of the Trinity here in this passage. Verse 4, the same Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, the same Lord, that's the Greek word kyrios that we saw last week. That's when Paul uses that word, he's almost always talking about Jesus. And in verse 6, the same God, the Greek word theos, referring to the Father. So diversity in the church has its roots in a triune God. In other words, it is the same God who provides all of these gifts for the body, but even that God is three persons in one, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. When you look at it that way, the emphasis clearly shifts from the people and the gifts to the one who is gifting them. As a church, what do we call ourselves? We call ourselves the body of Christ. That's right. The body of Christ. The emphasis is on Christ, not on us. Now, what is meant by the term the body of Christ? It's more than a euphemism for the church. It's a description of the church. We are the body of Jesus on earth. His body's not here, his physical body. He still bears the wounds, and he will for all eternity. He shows up in Revelation as the lamb who was slain. The marks are still there. But for the time being, he's not walking on earth. We are the body of Jesus on earth. In other words, we are the representation of Christ, the physical representation of Christ on earth. Do you remember all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where it says that God made us in his image? In other words, he made us to be his image bearers on earth. He's a spirit. You can't see him. So in order to see God, he created us so that we would be his likeness, not physically, but that we would have the characteristics and the attributes and the personalities, personality traits of God here on earth. Well, sin came in and, and marred all that. But now, because of the cross, we have the opportunity of being born again and to become, again, the image bearers of God here on earth. And so now, it is God's intent that the church would be the manifestation of God on earth, the physical representation of God as the body of Christ, the body of Jesus. We are the physical 
representation to the world who has no clue about what God is like. They see what Jesus is like by looking at us. Wow. So in verses 4 through 6, we have different gifts, different ministries, different workings, but it's all the same God who's doing it. So that we too will be unified just as the triune God is unified in the Godhead. Paul's emphasis here is on unity in diversity. And it's a unity that is grounded in the triune God as the Holy Trinity. And then verse 7 basically serves as the thesis statement for the passage. And actually for the next three chapters. Look at verse 7. It says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So here in this verse, the gifts and the ministries that he talked about up in verses 4 through 6 are all lumped together in one term called the manifestation of the Spirit. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The manifestation of the Spirit are gifts and ministries and workings. And they're given by God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in order to show himself in our midst so we get to see what he's like. That's what manifestation means. God is spirit. We can't see him, and so he manifests himself amongst us through the working out of these gifts so we get to see what he's like. So, if you don't use your gift, then we don't get to see that glimpse of God through you. We are deprived. See, your gift is not meant for you. It's meant for us. It's meant for the body, for the common good. Verse 7. You are gifted, that's true, but you are gifted to the body. You are a manifestation of the presence and the activity of God among us. You, using your gift, show us a little glimpse of what God is like. And every spiritual gift is a manifestation of God. And to each, he says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. God has gifted us all in order to reveal himself. None of us is the complete picture. So important. Your gift is given to you so you can serve God by serving us. So when you use your gift in somebody's life, they not only benefit from whatever help it is that your gift provides, but they benefit by getting a glimpse of that part of God. And likewise, when you choose not to use your gift, then not only do they not get the benefit of the practical help that your gift is supposed to provide, but they also miss out on seeing a very real manifestation of God. Now, in verses 8 through 11, Paul gives us just a sample list of some of the gifts. It's not an exhaustive list. We know that because there are other gifts that aren't mentioned here that are mentioned in other places in the New Testament. So here we have a short list of nine. Paul picked some to make a point, and we don't know why he picked these. Maybe these were the showy gifts that were causing the Corinthians to brag, and so these are the ones that Paul picks. Well, let's go ahead and read them, beginning in verse 8. He says, For to one is given, through the Spirit, the utterance of wisdom. The word utterance there is the word logos, the word of wisdom. To another, the utterance, the logos, of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions or distributes to each one individually as he wills. It's his call. Now, having read the list, let me reiterate that Paul is not teaching here about gifts. This is not a teaching on the specific gifts, the number, the kind, and the use. That's not what he's doing. This teaching that Paul is giving us is about unity in the church and how the Spirit builds that unity. So he says, to one is given this gift and to another that gift. Different gifts to each one, all by the same Spirit. All have some None have all. 
So what are these gifts? Well, even though Paul didn't intend this to be a teaching on the gifts, he mentions them here, and I'm charged with the responsibility of talking for 30 minutes, so let's look at them. Verse 8. He says, to, to one is given through the Spirit the word of wisdom, the logos of wisdom. So the gift is somehow the message of wisdom. And we know that wisdom was a big problem in Corinth. Go back and read chapters 1 and 2 again. This was a problem for them. They had this idea of what wisdom was, and it wasn't at all the wisdom that comes from God that's mentioned in James chapter 3 that comes down from above that's pure and peaceable and kind. Now, just at the outset here, let me say, I think we make a big mistake if we come to a list like this and we interpret it through a lens of the teaching of the charismatic church in America for the last 50 years. You hear the term word of wisdom, word of knowledge. For many of us, especially those of us who grew up spiritually in the 70s, that carries a very narrow connotation and meaning for us because we know how that, that terminology is used in certain churches. So, I don't really, I can't tell you exactly what this means, that, that um, some have the word of wisdom. Normally what you would do in a case like this is you would go to other passages and research it. The problem is this is the only place in the entire New Testament, the entire Bible, that the term word of wisdom or message of wisdom is used. And it's not even used in extra biblical writings of the time. This is it. This is all you get on the word of wisdom. It would be foolish for us to try to say, I know what this means. So I'll take a guess. Most likely, this gift is simply the gifting by God to a person to be able to give advice to people that is grounded in the wisdom of God. This is simply the gift of wise speech. If you take the words at their face value, that's what it means. The gift of wise speech. Now, verse 8 also talks about the word of knowledge according to the same spirit. And we've been told that the word of knowledge is some kind of prophetic prediction that somebody comes up and puts their hand on you or over you, and they make a prediction about you or a blessing on you. But that interpretation really isn't supported in the context. Now, I'm not saying that God can't or he won't do that. In fact, I'm pretty sure he does do that. We even see it in the New Testament, that happening. But I'm not convinced that that's what Paul's talking about here. What is the source of our knowledge about God? The Word of God, that's right. So at the very least, we can say that this gift is associated with knowledge about God's Word. And so the Word of Knowledge would be that gift of being able to give out the knowledge of God to another person. Now obviously, that gift overlaps with the gift of teaching. Not perfectly, they're not synonyms. They're, it's, not, it's not redundant. But there is an overlap, and we see that throughout all the gifts in these three chapters, and in Romans 12 and in Ephesians 4, we see that the, that the gifts overlap somewhat. Uh, verse 9 says, others get the gift of faith. Now, we know that faith leads to salvation. It takes faith to get saved, and we also know that that faith is a gift from God, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here because we all get that gift. This is a special gift and, and it's, it appears to be this is the supernatural ability of some Christians to be able to trust God no matter the situation, no matter how hopeless things seem. A person who's gifted with the gift of faith is gifted with spiritual eyes to be able to see the situation from God's perspective and no matter how bad the situation looks, they are convinced that God is in control. It's okay. We're going to be all right. All things work together for the good of those who love him. Verse 9. It also talks about the gifts of healing. Now, it's interesting here because the word gifts is plural in this sentence, and in the Greek, the word healing is also plural. These are gifts of healings. It could be translated as gifts of different kinds of healings. 
which means there's more than just one kind of healing. And apparently, this is more than what Jesus and Peter and Paul did when they would touch somebody and they would be miraculously healed on the spot by a, a, a power from on high through that person. Now, I've actually got to do that once in my life. Come to Sunday school. We'll talk about it if you want. But um, the fact that I've done it once is proof I don't have that gift. A person with the gift of healing wouldn't exercise it once in their life. And actually, God had me exercise it in the life of an unbeliever who still refused to accept Christ after he was healed. Um, so he says, the gifts of healings, what could other healings be? Well, I don't think we should be too quick to exclude medical healing here. People, whether professional or not, who have the gift of bringing healing into somebody else's life by their presence and their ministry. Susie, I think of you in your ministry. Not necessarily um, an activity that defies the laws of nature, but just as, as Proverbs said, that righteousness brings healing to the bones and healing to the flesh. And some people have that gift to be able to do that. Verse 10 says some people are gifted with the working of miracles. Now actually the word miracle is not in the Greek. The literal Greek phrase is the workings of power. Now the translation in most of our Bibles is miraculous and it's, it's warranted. I'm not going to argue with a whole bunch of, of Greek scholars. But isn't it true that all these gifts are supernatural? In that sense, they're all miraculous. I think the literal translation here is very helpful. The person with this gift is able to bring the power of God into a situation or into a person's life that defies the laws of this natural world. They do things that defy the laws of nature. Verse 10 also talks about others who were given the gift of prophecy. We think of the gift of prophecy in the Old Testament and we see prophets who are foretelling the future. That is probably not the primary use of this word, although I'm not saying that's impossible. But primarily, this is the gift of being able to speak the truth of God into a situation or into a person's life that fits that situation and that purpose and that person right at that time. Now, some people have equated the gift of prophecy with the gift of teaching, and I would tend to disagree with that assessment. For one, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, refers to women prophesying in the church. Paul wrote that. But also in 1 Corinthians 2.12, Paul prohibits women from teaching or having authority over men. Now, I think it's more, more reasonable to assume that prophecy is a person's ability to speak a declaration or a proclamation that God has laid on his or her heart or brought to their mind in their own words. And it's not necessarily infallible. Paul tells us to weigh the prophecies. And in chapter 14, he even allows one person who's prophesying to interrupt another person who's prophesying. We would never do that with Isaiah or the reading of Matthew. So prophecy is not on the same level of inerrancy and authority as, as the teaching of the Word of God. Teaching is explaining the meaning of the revealed Word of God in the Scripture. So while teaching is passing on the truth found in the Bible... Prophecy has a more responsive element. There's a situation, there's a problem, it needs to be addressed, and the person who has the gift of prophecy is able to speak God's directives into that person or that situation. Now, prophecy could be exercised while the person's teaching or preaching, but not necessarily so. Verse 10 also talks about other saints who are given the ability to distinguish between spirits. This is a kind of spiritual discernment that enables a person to be able to see whether what they just heard or what they just saw was actually of God. Was that miracle that was just worked actually of the Holy Spirit's power or some other spirit? Was that teaching that was just given actually of the Holy Spirit's unction or some other spirit? We're told that Satan masquerades as an angel of light and it's easy to be duped by that. And so the body is gifted with people who are able to cut through that fog and see whether that was the Holy Spirit or some other 
evil, lying spirit. Verse 10 also mentions the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Now, these gifts are mentioned 15 times in 1 Corinthians alone, far more than any other gift that's mentioned. To me, that's an obvious indication that these gifts were a problem. The gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues were a problem in the church of Corinth. This gift was controversial in Corinth, and it's controversial today. And so I'm going to sidestep it. No, I'm kidding. Um, we're <laughs> we're going to be talking about this a lot over the next coming months, so I'm not going to get into any great detail here. Just suffice it to say that the gift of tongues is an utterance in another language that apparently is unintelligible to the speaker and unintelligible to most of the hearers, and so therefore requires an interpretation. And Paul tells us that these should be done with an interpretation, that they should not disrupt the, the, the worship service. And he also tells us that it's more desirable to have the gift of prophecy than to have the gift, the gift of tongues because prophecy edifies the body while tongues edifies the speaker. But we'll get into that more later, I'm sure. And then finally, in verse 11, we see all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who distributes them to each one individually as he wills. And it's all for the common good. These gifts come from God and he gets to decide who gets what. It's his call. And so there should be no competition here, no envy, no jealousy, no strife, no striving, because God does it according to his will and according to his good pleasure. And who are we to argue with God? So what we see here is that each one is gifted by God in some way or some ways. Some have this gift, some have that gift, but no one has all of the gifts. Not one of us has all of the gifts. Only Jesus had it all. Only Jesus was the perfect incarnation of God on earth. Only Jesus was the perfect manifestation of God on earth. The rest of us are imperfect. They, none of us were playing with a full deck. Right? We're all missing cards. Now, we all do bring something to the table. And God uses that to weave us together. You have your place in the body, so do I. We are not all Christ, but we are all collectively the body, the manifestation of Christ here on earth. You might be a hand, I might be a foot, but together we are the manifestation of Christ on earth, the visible body of Christ as his image bearers. What a powerful mystery. And what a wonderful responsibility. We are to show to the world what Jesus is like. And we do that together. God set it up so that we are the Christ that people see. And I mean we, as a group. We, as a body, as an organism. But that only happens as we serve each other in our lack, in our need. I mean, the, the implications of this are really powerful, and I, I, we will be um, seeing this as we move along through these passages. But first of all, for me, what comes from this is the realization that none of us has it all together. What are the implications of that? We are all lacking. We are all needy. None of us has it all. And none of us has it all put together. Now, I would hope that that teaching would allow you to relax. You don't have to do it all. And you don't have to fix it all. Give yourself some grace here. You don't have to be me, and I don't have to be you. Isn't that a freeing thought? You get to be you, and I get to be me. Also, since none of us has it all together, not only should it allow us to extend grace to ourselves, but that should enable us to extend grace to everybody around us. They're not playing with a full deck. It's okay. Give them some grace. Jesus is the only person who always did it all right because he's God. 
Are you frustrated with somebody here at Bethel because they're not Jesus? Get over it. That's my best advice for you. They're not Jesus. They're lacking. And they are a deeply needy person. Now, if you can't get over that, then go talk to them. Get it out in the open. Work through it. Matthew 5, Matthew 18. And I'm not talking about sin here necessarily in in this context. I'm talking about maybe someone who didn't serve you in the way you thought you should be served here at Bethel. Or someone who didn't serve us in the way you thought they should serve us as a body here at Bethel. But if we understand that our lack and our deficit is part of God's plan so that somebody else can come along and meet that deficit in order to draw us together as a body, then I think that will give us a new kind of power to extend grace to each other. For instance, I'm a biology, biology teacher. The hand can't eat. The mouth can But it is the hand's job to grab the food and to bring it to the mouth. That's great for the mouth. What about the hand? The hand still doesn't have any nourishment. How does that happen? Well, the mouth masticates the food and then transfers it to the esophagus, and the esophagus transfers it to the stomach and the small intestine, where the circulatory system picks up all those wonderful nutrients and bring them to the rest of the body, and some of those nutrients, that nourishment, gets back to the hand and the hand gets nourished in a very roundabout way. And it takes all of those structures and all of those parts working together to make it work. But the hand needs all those parts. It can't do it on its own. Your hand can't feed itself. You can soak your hand in a bowl of beans all day long and you will not add one calorie to one cell in that hand. Your hand is going to actually have to grasp some of those beans and serve the mouth and then wait for a while in order to get the nourishment that it needs. And it does no good for the hand to get frustrated with the mouth. You know, can you imagine the hand saying to the mouth, okay, you know what, I've been serving you for years. You've never done anything for me. Okay, you pulled a splinter out of, my, out, of my hand, out of my finger with your teeth. Other than that, all these years, you've done nothing for me. All I do is serve you. Well, that's not the mouse ministry. It's not his job in the body. In the exact same way, God uses us, our needs and our gifts, for the good of others. So that then others will minister to others And eventually that comes back around and ministers to us. The hand can't feed himself. He is dependent on the mouth. The organs are interdependent in the body. Our growth and our sustenance as Christians can only happen as we as a body work together. And this is why I'm so confused by people who say, I don't need a church. I just go walk down a mountain trail and, and I'm closer to God when I'm doing that than when I'm in a, in a room with a bunch of Christians and hypocrites. Are we saying then that the church only exists for you so you feel good, so you feel close to God? Is that really what the church is? See, the problem is it can't work that way. That would be like me cutting off my hand and laying it over there hoping that it's going to flourish. It can't. And now not only is it laying over there decaying, but my body is disadvantaged. I can't scratch my head. I can't feed my mouth. A lot of things I can't do without that hand. See, when we were born again, we were created or recreated in Christ Jesus to do the good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. And that includes the good works that we do here in the body. And in the process of doing that, Others will be doing their ministry, their acts of good deeds, their service, and we all get fed, we all get nourished, we all feel loved, we all feel cared for. One organ can't do all that. It takes all the organs working together. 
the needs are just as important as the gifts. And all these things work together toward a common goal, or actually several common goals, two of them in particular. First, we work together as a body for the health of the body, right, to the glory of God. But the health of the body is not an end in itself. I mean, you don't take care of your body just so you can sit around all day and play video games. No, you take care of your body so you can go out and accomplish your job and do what it is you've been given to do. Being a healthy church is not primarily about just having it together, having great programs and, and being well-liked. No, it's so we can do what God has given us to do in this world. Marines don't train as hard as they do just so they can look buff and take selfies and feel good about themselves. No, Marines train really hard so that when the time comes, they're able to do the missions that they're given to do, that they're assigned to. The same is true for us. God never said he was going to reach the world through you. I'm going to repeat that. God never said he was going to reach the world through you. He said he's going to do it through the church. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 says that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known to all creation. Through the church, not through lone rangers, through the body of Christ. In Matthew 16, Jesus told people, Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, in that word picture that Jesus just painted, who's attacking the gates of hell? Is it Peter? No, it's the church. He's building us, and he's equipping us, and he's gifting us, and he's knitting us together so that we can go do battle with the devil so that we can accomplish the mission that he's given us to do. Let's pray. Father, we realize that um, we, we are so needy, and sometimes we feel so bad for that. Help us to realize it's the way you set it up, so that we would become interdependent on each other and on you. And I do pray, Father, that you would continue to grow us as a body. I'm not thinking of numbers. I'm thinking about the gifting and the strengthening of this body so that we might reach this city and the people around us so that they might see what Jesus is like. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us, please?